All right. 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 Hello and What's up? welcome to. Hello and welcome to Leviathan News. Today is August 16th and uh, tried something a little more different this morning. We'll see how it goes. We're going to cut it out anyways, and this will be the start anyways. But if you tune into our pre-show, there's some nice little music that we have. And we also had a very cool picture by the talented Saint MG. Let me just pull this up, share his page. I uh, saw this this morning. It's a pretty cool picture. It's pretty nice, isn't it? Uh, I like that. So on to the news. The big news story of the day is that the CFTC has approved Coinbase to offer U.S. customers access to crypto futures. And they do this by uh, uh, offering it through Coinbase Financial Markets Incorporated. And they say they have secured a regulatory approval from the National Futures Association a self-regulatory organization designated by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission to operate as a futures commission merchant and offer eligible U.S. customers access to crypto futures on its platform. Um, this means that I believe they'll be able to offer regulated and leveraged crypto futures for verified customers. And uh, they've been going after this application for a while. It was first filed in September of 2021 uh, that they filed this application for this uh, FCM license. And it's actually pretty big because while spot trading is uh, quite large in the United States, the derivative trading market is much, much larger on an order of magnitude. You're probably doing 10 times more volume in the derivative markets versus the spot markets. And so um, Coinbase's vice president of institutional product, Greg Tussar, says that uh, the ability to trade using margin gives customers leverage and access to the crypto markets with less upfront investment than traditional spot trading. Being able to express long and short positions, investors also use derivatives to manage risk on underlying crypto assets. So this is pretty cool. Uh, you will be able to trade the CME futures through uh, Coinbase and probably use their their APIs, their singular APIs to also uh, run your strategies on their spot markets at the same time as well, too. So Will this be open to all uh, consumers? Uh, probably specific U.S. customers that have to go through like a, a verification process. Uh, typically, when you're trading futures, you just have to show that you have some knowledge of how futures work. Um, and you but just have to like, like opt in. It is for retail, yeah. No, this is a retail license. No, it's not for like uh, accredited uh, investors or something like that. I don't believe so. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's like the casual retail user is the big difference here that then I can trade on margin? Yeah, well, you'll be able to buy the CME. I believe you'll be able to buy the CME Bitcoin product, uh, which is offered already. So if you weren't, already trading the CME product inside of one of your brokerage accounts, I believe you'll be able to do it in the Coinbase uh, account soon. So right. could be wrong. If, uh, if I am wrong, then <laughs> please reach out. <laughs> um, but, it, but for if, my grandmother, like I guess the difference is she can already go on Coinbase and buy a Bitcoin. Why would she want to buy a futures instead? Uh, to play the spread because you could buy that Bitcoin and then sell a future and then uh, go flat and collect whatever that spread is. Uh, so say you like, you know, you want to play the spread or you want to play uh, other stuff that is involved in the derivative markets. But it's pretty cool. Grandma know. She'll be excited. Yeah. So if they're able to uh, enter the crypto futures game, it'll be a watershed moment because they'll be the first major U.S. first U.S. exchange in general uh, that will have access to regulated derivative products. So what's your kind of guess at the inside uh, baseball going on here? Because obviously the SEC is suing Coinbase, and yet the CFTC is approving them for this futures market. Like, is well, the, kind of these, like are, these are already regulated markets. These are regulated products that exist already as a C CF 
FTC futures commodity or commodity future. And in theory, Coinbase was like legally allowed to do what they were doing because they got SEC approval to IPO and then the SEC comes back and attacks them. So this is kind of like good cop, bad cop going on between the two agencies or like jockeying for turf or like? Uh, no, no, it's just different products. Remember, like um, it's, it's just different products here. I mean, we're talking about a, a regulated commodity future versus what the SEC is alleging to be unregulated uh, securities futures. Yeah, so Sonny Orba was saying uh, you'll just be able to hedge your position on the same platform instead of having to use a brokerage account. So beforehand, you would have to like split margin between your brokerage account and Coinbase. Uh, so you could buy spot on Coinbase and have your part of your uh, collateral there. Uh, but then you'd also have to have a, uh, a brokerage account that was also funded as well, too. Now... Uh, you'll be able to have all of your funds in one place and be able to buy spot and then also hedge out your position if you want to uh, on Coinbase as well, too. And uh, is it uh, like, when is it starting, does it say? Uh, they'll probably roll it out soon. I mean, typically you get a license. They probably already have the technological capability to launch it, but um, usually once you get the license, we'll probably see it within the next quarter. Well, um, I always don't, don't really understand the, if uh, the if between the different authorities like the CFTC and the SEC, there's actually a cooperation or a competition. Like uh, it sometimes it seems a bit uh, unclear, but maybe it's just uh, because I'm not uh, familiar enough with uh, what each of the parties do. Well, the SEC is built for uh, regulating investment products. And the CFTC is built for regulating commodities and they can work together on, you know, an asset can potentially both be a commodity and a security at the same time, or it can have, uh, you can have a commodity inside of a securities contract. So there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, mix and match and where different, re different regulatory agencies would be uh, used and approved. So like if you're, you know, selling barrels of oil in a futures contract, that would be the CTFC. Um, but if you're packaging those futures contracts into a ETF, then selling that ETF to, to retail clients, now the SEC gets involved. So uh, it's just a back and forth thing. I think the, I think the, um, the issue at hand inside the United States is um, the, there's people that want crypto to not be regulated by either agency, um, there's people that want the SEC and then there's people that want the C CFTC for different reasons. And so there's a push and pull between all those people um, th that uh, is going to determine how all this works out. So Always great to see new products uh, like reach the, the public. So we're definitely looking forward to this one. And uh, yeah. Coinbase seems strong, uh, seems strong lately with base and this, and uh, it really is becoming like a, a hub for uh, many uh, people, especially US residents, I guess, uh, to mm -hmm. have a one-stop shop for, to, for a lot of crypto needs for the average uh, user, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's what I would point, if I would point my, my dad to that. So <laughs> actually I think my dad buys his stuff through Coinbase uh, when, he does, <laughs> when he does buy crypto, uh, wondering, what his son has ended up, you know, just like <laughs> you could have been an engineer or a doctor, <laughs> but yet here you are reporting about crypto all day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day he'll be proud. Sam. No, no, no. He is. He's, he's very <laughs> proud. Uh, at my, my parents like this industry a lot. So um, they just ask me like strange questions sometimes. Um, speaking of base, we also had another base product or like protocol uh, rug yesterday. Swirlend on base rugged 784K down to 49. Oh, sorry. Uh, they bridged $289,000 worth of crypto from base to Ethereum, uh, including 104 ETH, 32,000 USDC, and they still hold 92 ETH on base. Yeah, that's two in one day. That sucks. I got rugged yesterday. I, I had a, I realized I had, like after the stream that I had a, a half of ETH 
roughly of uh, LP in that uh, in that rocket pool. Was it rocket? Is called rocket pool? Yeah, um, or rocket swap. Yeah, that was what it was called. Uh, just because they had gotten some decent TVL and it seemed like they were like okay. Uh, and now after these two rugs, we've seen most of the liquidity migrate over to Uniswap V3. Uh, it's funny that, you know, the incumbents come and that's where people flee to safety for <laughs> after the, after these like new projects, just rug them out. Yeah. Well, a rug has become, uh, you know, uh, an everyday thing. Uh, instead of saying to yourself, oh, wow, there was a rug, you, you say to yourself, thank God, it was a small amount of money for... Uh... I know. Yeah. Here's a question. I saw this the other day, and maybe you guys can answer it. Did anybody actually make money? Like, did retail actually do well providing LP versus just holding tokens ever on, like, the long run? I think uh, it was Alunara who asked that, right? Yeah, I saw that the other day. Should get uh, Eleanor examples? back on the show. Um, so I would say that I farm from several different wallets, and in all but the ones where I held Curve ETH, I'm ahead. So I made some money LPing, and Curve ETH, I feel like it's like too soon to say uh, soon. because there may be a recovery. Yeah. What about uh, Olympus DAO, right? Well, I did, I did buy some Olympus tokens uh, at one point, so I lost about like 30% on that. Oh, no, so. about the top. <laughs> uh, but let me think about LP. I think there was probably some things back in DeFi summer when the rates were insane and everything was doing really well. But since then, it's become very PVP. It's very hard to, to do well with LP. And then also recently, like you're giving your, you're giving your tokens over to potentially like a, a DAX, like Rocket Swap, where they can just rug you. Uh, but that's a little bit different. That's they they minted out their token, and uh, I'll say that um, I've been uh, playing with Curve USD, and mm -hmm. even despite the two percent uh, haircut I took by having put it in Conic, I'm ahead on all my uh, Curve USD positions as well. Very nice. You're just adding liquidity. Uh, I'm lending uh, different various assets as collateral uh, and using that to like LP and various pools. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's been going pretty good. You know, one question that I've seen a bunch over the past few days is people just really flummoxed about how this curve lending and leverage goes with Curve USD. Uh, I saw somebody in the Curve chat asking, well, hey, if I can put one ETH in and then borrow $11,000 worth of CRV USD, like why should I even pay it back? So I think the first thing I'd say is if that's your understanding of how it works, you probably shouldn't be playing with leverage. <laughs> like you just, uh, you need to know a bit more about how it works under the hood. Um, obviously that is not how it works because uh, Mitch is a bit smarter than that, right? Like he wouldn't have a free money printer like uh, that would cause a death spiral. Um, the way that it works is if you like, for example, the market's been like a little bit turbulent lately, right? If you expect that Bitcoin is going to do nothing but like rocket in the future, um, you can basically, ordinarily the way that it works is you like lend your Bitcoin. Let's say you lend one Bitcoin and take out a loan of like 20,000 USD, right? With leverage is you take that 20,000 USD, buy as much Bitcoin as you can, lend it back, increase the collateral size. So what you end up with at the end of all the leverage is you get $0 back. You have nothing in your wallet, but you have a much larger Bitcoin collateral position. So maybe instead of you turn that one Bitcoin into like eight Bitcoin or something. If the price of Bitcoin does go up, let's say 2x, all of a sudden you have uh, you know, the right to buy back that uh, re repay that loan at the initial price. Um, but you know, because Bitcoin's done a 2x or whatever, you get back uh, like eight Bitcoin for the price of like half that. So it's a good deal if you expect that Bitcoin's going to rocket in the future. And then and because of the friendlier liquidation mechanism, if you're wrong and it kind of like stays at that price before it skyrockets, like you're not as bad off as you would be with other forms of leverage is the theory. Um, but you still have to know how to play it, right? Yeah. And also when you lever up like that, even if the price doesn't go anywhere, you're going to be paying higher interest rates. So your interest rate is also leverage up as well, too. So wh what's the rates right now? Probably like one to two percent. Uh, yeah, right now it's super low, but it could shoot up to 10% tomorrow if the system becomes imbalanced. And all of a sudden, 
you know, if you yeeted your entire net worth into it, you have to basically pay interest on nine X that amount, which you might not be able to afford. Exactly. And needless to say, if it goes down, you lose everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And hey. we had a really nice explainer on this We on the Leviathan telegram channel, which you guys should go and check it out. We'll put a, or you can find a link in the show notes, but I'm sure you're all subscribed to it already. If you're watching the live stream, uh, we have the complete noobs explainer for how CRV USD leverage works, which uh, Garrett just ran us through. Also, uh, whoever posted that, very handsome as well. So uh, you can't go wrong whether you're watching <laughs> Leviathan or reading it on X. Uh, speaking of speaking of Leviathan, and we've just posted this up here, we have this nice little QR code where you can donate to Leviathan uh, and and help the show grow. Uh, we have we value our, our donators maybe there will be some merch in the future um and yeah so here it is you can follow the qr code and send us some eth on arbitrum uh, it's only an arbitrum link we're working on setting up a, a give to but we'll we'll figure that out later in the week um oh yeah so yesterday defi advisor you and i talked at length about the recent partnership that Gitcoin had taken with Shell Oil Company. And everybody on crypto Twitter rapidly was adding or like subtweeting Kevin Iwaki, the former founder of Gitcoin, uh, to understand what he thought. And he actually posted a very in depth and uh, thoughtful response to this whole thing. So let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. And we'll roll through this because I think there's some interesting points in here. So he said that uh, Fifth World Zach challenged him to write a, uh, a nuanced thread embracing the plurality of paradoxes that will be sincerely contemplated and then responded to with equal depth and care by the good people of crypto Twitter. Uh, so he says he doesn't really personally care for the shell brand and he says, I doubt many people will opt into the optional shell funding pool, but let's see, it's a free market. Uh, he also thinks that 500K is a pittance comparatively to what he thinks they've done uh, to create the, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, and he says the brand damage to Gitcoin is immense and he doesn't like the greenwashing. Um, so he, he starts to like go into some ideas and he says that, you know, Gitcoin shouldn't greenwash. Uh, the environment, he says they should probably be paying like tens of millions in the rounds, not 500,000, um, so that they could, you know, make a difference for, for the things that they've done. He says, uh, another approach is to, uh, acknowledges, acknowledge the nuances and contradictions inherent in ushering in a clean energy future, um, whatever that means. And, uh, it says nuance is the enemy of the common understanding. And so like, he says, then he gets to like the meat of it. He says, what do I think of this shell issue when viewed as part of a pattern of recent troubling string of messaging F-ups? Not just shell this time around, but what about the, uh, the shit storm around the DNI initiative last round with Daphne? So he says, uh, last cycle, I, I, I plus my team built the legitimacy of Gitcoin brick by brick, and it's been crushing to see it get tarnished by these controversies. But I also remind myself of those controversies uh, of my day and there were many and then we got through those as well too and he says that he's reminded of like the things that he's trying to do which is to like create a movement of mutualistic and legitimate funding for public goods uh, that will eventually really reach civilization scale and he's gonna they're gonna fall short again and again and again but they're gonna keep on building uh so you know he says that there's always gonna be politics in these public good rounds, right? Some communities want a DEI round. Some people think that's just woke BS. Some people want to fund open source software. Some people don't care, right? Some people are okay with the oil company giving the money, some are not. And he says it's impossible to serve all the mimetic tribes at the same time. And this is a fundamental tension in what Gitcoin is trying to do. So, uh, you know, this is why he moved Gitcoin away from being a company towards being a DAO so that the communities can decide for themselves and have sovereign 
uh, decision-making power uh, to on credibly neutral protocols. And so at the end of the day, there's always going to be differences and they may be distasteful at times, but you know, Gitcoin is pointing for a larger purpose than that. And hopefully there are some things that are learned here, like potentially Gitcoin should not really be making, uh, these huge partnership announcements on the main Gitcoin handle and on the, uh, on their website. Um, and you know, he kind of imagines like these teams, like these, like different teams, like an environmentalist team, like a big finance team, a big oil team, golf team, all trying different public good, uh, public good funding rounds and uh, really working towards decentralization. And so he believes in the sub DAO model and, uh, wants it to continue so i thought it was a really nice response what did you guys I think, think i think so too i think uh, like uh, it shows uh, i don't know if exactly carriage is the word but i'm uh, happy to see that he's like at least uh, honest and open about uh, some of the issues uh, around the uh, gitcoin would you and say maturity think... would you say maturity or i because that's what i see it's just someone who's yeah. like you know it, again yeah, well, he's he's already like it's his it's his company slash DAO that he founded and has stepped away from, um, so. Yeah, I think he has a mature view on uh, like uh, his creation in a way. Mm -hmm. Yet I do think that you know uh, uh, his main point is what he says for me personally is what he says in the beginning that uh, this just uh, interferes with the with the brand itself. Like Gitcoin is a brand. Ever since what happened uh, at the like at the first, it was, I think, on the first month that we started the uh, streaming that the DEI stuff uh, happened. And mm -hmm. like, to be honest, man, I'd, if if we do something uh, like uh, similar with uh, Leviathan, like... Oh, we do it every day. Time, we do it every day, Defy Advisor. <laughs> no, but no, no, no. That's not what I mean. All right. I mean, okay. what I mean is that if we now go to uh, like the funding route, Honestly, mm -hmm. I don't want us to, to pick uh, Gitcoin because I think the brand is already like uh, in a way for me personally, I can't really uh, like connect to the brand. And I think that it's it's very hard to have a brand that is, uh, you know, actually not, not non-political uh, for sure. And uh, I, I don't know, uh, Gitcoin is going to have to be, do some stuff to really get, I think, people like me with our side on maybe on the political map to be more open and say, yeah, these Gitcoin guys are really objective and it doesn't matter whether we're uh, right wing, left wing or whatever. They really give an equal shot to everyone. <laughs> right now, it seems that uh, they uh, tend to be on uh, one side of the political spectrum. So it, take, it makes the other side want to step away from them, I think. So we are planning at Leviathan to launch through Gib2. Uh, Gib and uh, this seems like a very easy way to provide your ENS handle or address and then simply fund people. And you don't really have to like do anything else. We can provide the link and then people just can come to Gib2 and uh, type in our ENS. What's our ENS? Do we have an ENS? Not yet. Yeah, I don't well, think so. I think we have not, not yet. Uh, so that you can like search for people's ENS like mine and then you can come and send them some ETH. Actually, you can send them really anything, any kind of token. Well, is it just four oh, tokens? Oh, cool. Yeah. What's the name of this uh, website? So it's gib.to. Get to. Yeah, cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, their logo, you know what their logo reminds me of? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's uh, like the counter argument for what I said, like uh, the other side of it, maybe. It's kind of like the logo of the Babylon Bean, huh? <laughs> yeah a little bit yeah uh and you can also give them multiple uh networks as well too so if you want to give some arbitrum eth we're also there as well too we'll get this set up we have a we have a little multi-sig for leviathan uh, or we accept all our all of our donations to the two and um, we'll have this up and in the show notes later this week cool. um, yeah okay what else do we got we have binance which is sunsetting it's Fiat to crypto payment platform Binance Connect, just over a year at launch. Binance only said that 
they're directing resources to other more important parts of their business, but it potentially could be that they are facing regulatory crackdown globally and that this fiat payments platform was no longer was no longer uh, looking good in the eyes of the regulators. That would have to be my guess. Um, I have no idea because it's like Binance is super opaque to me as a U.S. citizen. Um, it looks, you know, I was reading through the article. They wound this up about a year and a half ago. It looks like there was some uh, uh, people who are like high up in the great British government who were like uh, helping out with it. So I guess, uh, I guess, yeah, your take is the same as mine. It seems like they're just having some issues. Yeah, Bor Boris Johnson was helping out, wasn't he? That could be it. Yeah, that's pretty. that's pretty high up. Uh, and then we also have some news about JPEG. So they have launched PIP 74, where the DAO is going to choose disbursement of the addresses impacted by the curve hack. And so uh, while they did lose 6,106 WETH, they recovered 5,495 WETH related to the exploit. And so they have a bunch of ideas about how they can uh, like send money back. Uh, they have six different options, and uh, I don't want to get into them. Maybe you guys have taken a look at it and can take a look at the but... bottom. They have a summary at the bottom uh, spreadsheet. Oh, hey, look at there. this. That's nice. Okay. Um, so the first option is JPEG DAO reimburses unrecovered funds. Uh, yes or no? JPEG DAO reimburses losses. Uh, it seems like the PF or the PETH, F, PETH, ETH, PETH, ETH liquidity providers. Uh, heard by arbitragers will get reimbursed. Um, but maybe the DAO reimburses uh, unrecovered funds as well, too. Uh, there's also a question about JPEG Citadel liquidity providers being reimbursed. They will be reimbursed. Five out of six will be 100%, potentially uh, in the F group, they'll get 90%. Uh, should PE speculators receive their cost back in ETH or JPEG? Um, Yes or no. Uh, Non-Citadel liquidity providers are reimbursed. And then also uh, JPEG PETH liquidity providers are airdrop liquidity tokens at the time of the snapshot. Uh, single side liquidity is added back to the pool. And then realized losses to liquidity providers of the JPEG uh, PETH pool are reimbursed. And they have some numbers down here uh, covering how that 5,400 ETH uh, will be distributed out. So really, the big questions are, should they reimburse the unrecovered funds? Yes or no. And then also, should speculators either absorb the cost of the 611 uh, WETH? And should non-Citadel liquidity providers be reimbursed? I'm guessing no. <laughs> so uh, well, there are no votes for this yet. Uh, it did just go live on Snapshot a few minutes ago. Uh, so we'll see how this plays out over the next three days. I wonder if they, uh, if some of the people that can vote are going to sit out to make uh, the vote, uh, the voting more objective. Because I you think mean, that, uh, a very yeah, well-known, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, black and white whale who. Um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of. But you know, I, I don't really even uh, think he's the only one. I think there are quite a few people on. Uh, yeah, JPEG from the community and the people behind it, that they can probably vote uh, on whatever they want. But I do think that at least, uh, you know, there's kind of like, it's very nice to see this uh, proposal. And honestly, I want to see how the votes uh, go. Maybe I'll have some additional comments. But, uh, you know, at least most of the money is back uh, besides the 10% uh, and uh, at least trying to do the fair thing about it. And, you know, DAOs, uh, like, as much as we want them to be decentralized, uh, we all know that DAOs are usually not that decentralized uh, yet. Well, that's a question for another day. In other news, we have Frax has essentially voted. The voting period is not over yet, but they have reached quorum for a positive vote to acquire CRV with treasury funds. And so... Uh, when this passes, the Frax DAO will acquire CRV through an OTC OTC deal uh, from Michael uh, at the price that he was selling at, and they will use one million Frax to, I believe, acquire five million CRV. So, 
Uh, I actually wrote this one. I'll put this up. You went one million fracs or one million FXS? What does it mean? Like one million. How? One million fracs will be transferred to Michael, and the frac style will receive five million CRV, which yeah, but will immediately it, get locked up. Well, isn't that much lower than the price that uh, most OTC deals uh, were? They like that means yeah. a zero point two uh, price, no? I thought oh no, not zero point two. It's like three million. Is it three million? Three million. Oh, okay. Makes more sense. Is that right? I, I What's got, the? I was like, oh my god, they got a good deal there. What's uh? Hold on, I'll I'll do the math here. I, it's either three million or five. I thought it was okay. I must have done the math wrong. <laughs> yeah, if it's five. Oh, two point five million. Oh yeah, two point five million. That's it. Sorry. Cool, cool. Yeah. That's, so that's this will be the four. final OTC deal if it goes through. Is my understanding. The final one. Wow. I'm, let's take a look at the Dune dashboard uh, just to recap this. So if this is the final uh, curve OTC, um, that means that uh, over the last month, Michael has OTC'd 157 million curve and raised $62 million, soon to be $63 million or close to $64 million. Um, what a time to be alive. <laughs> that's the best sentence that you could have said that's so good and if you all are interested speaking of the curve otc deals this morning there was a pretty interesting thread by evgeny gavoy from winter mute about their calculus and what they were planning on doing with the um with the uh their particular like terms and their otc deal so I brought it up on screen here, but basically they, um, you know, they basically had a deal with Mitch and kind of in the immediate aftermath of everything, there were some people who noticed that they sent like a great portion of it to Binance and they were like laughing. They're like, oh, ha ha, Mitch is so stupid. Wintermute rugged him. <laughs> um, but, you know, in, in fact, what happened and Mitch said separately was like, um, this is part of the deal. Uh, they basically said that like half was going to be used for like uh, trading C5, D5. The other half was locked and they had a choice about what they wanted to do with it. Uh, they ended up this morning locking it as CVX CRV, um, which you know, drastically uh, had a huge impact on their peg of CVX CRV. So a pretty interesting thread to go through the calculus. And you know, Mitch had noted when this happened that like one of the reasons that he wanted to like give Wintermute a slightly better deal was that he was really interested in using them for like any future um uh um uh work around like Project Mariana for market making where arbitrage traders is gonna be like a pretty huge deal. Can we talk about this Wi-Fi deal? Because uh this actually was posted in conjunction with the tweet. So uh, Wintermute has requested approval of a, a Wi-Fi loan to their trading firm, uh, authorizing a transfer of 350 Wi-Fi, which is $2.18 million, from the Dow's treasury to the trading firm for 12 months at a 10 basis point interest rate to be, paid, to be paid in kind at the end of the loan term. And as part of uh, Wintermute's continued engagement with Yearn, uh, Wintermute is planning to use its funds of up to 3 million curve to buy YCRV and subsequently add and deploy our assets to the YCRV CRV pool on Yearn for a minimum of six months. And they're doing this to help rebalance the pool, which is currently sitting at 69% to 31%, and also improve the peg, which is sitting at 8% slippage right now uh, for larger trades. And it will bring it down to 1.5% uh, slippage uh, based on their uh, specifications pretty interesting deal actually yeah to be honest uh, I'm, I'm becoming more and more interested in what uh, Jan is doing with uh, YCRV and the whole uh, like I, I think that's one of the CRV rappers that maybe gets the most uh, attention but uh, I'm not so sure we, uh, that should be the case to be honest but maybe Kelkep will know more about that than me probably yeah, I think the I think the sticking point here is going to be the Wi-Fi loan uh, because um, the <laughs> so they borrow Wi-Fi, right? They can hedge it out, and if the price of Wi-Fi goes down during that period, uh, they actually make money. So is these these loan deals are um, like call options almost? Uh, yeah. It, like if if the price of well, sorry, they're 
quasi put options. Sorry, if they can hedge out everything, uh, so they hold spot, they can short it out. Um, probably do some other derivatives tradings as well too, um, and uh, make sure that they have very little exposure on the delta side. Uh, and then at the end of the term, return the funds for a ten basis point like fee over the course of a year, which is not much. Um, I don't know. Do you think they could just like go out and buy the Wi-Fi instead of borrowing it? I guess they just don't want the exposure. They're market making firm. It makes sense. Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. Uh, the the why CRV uh, CRV pool thing is interesting though. Uh, that they do want to bring their curve. They're kind of like saying like give us a loan and in return we'll fix your why CRV peg. You think it's reasonable? Uh, why not? If yeah. uh, if, if Gitcoin can uh, tell you that you have to uh, be fifty percent women uh, in order to uh, get the vote, then why wow. can't uh, people uh, do business with each other? You know, I, mean, yeah. I, I know it's uh, like a weird example, but like uh, I don't really see something that's that was just one. Uh, okay, just to be clear, that was one initiative. It wasn't like the entire thing. It's like one small thing, and. Here on the Curve Wars page, we have uh, the three different, or how many are there three here? Or are there are four? Uh, there's, there's three. three, kind of tough yeah. to see. So I see SD curve, Y curve, and convex curve as well too. And it looks like uh, Y curve has, has suffered. It's, it's got a 3% uh, off peg right now while SD curve and CVX curve are sitting at 98%. And also during the sell-off back in August, uh, it actually depegged the most. It had looks like it had the most volatility as well too. So this proposal would actually help tighten things up. Um, but the question is, is, is it too positive in the, like are the, are the terms that Wintermute is getting uh, extractive or is it beneficial for both parties? You know, it's um, if you look at the whole history, which is up here, like Y curve has been fairly good at its peg. Um, the one that's always fudded is the CVX CRV peg, mm -hmm. which, you know, as you can see, had been as low as 80% uh, because it was sort of designed as like the sort of like soft peg. And that was like easy to keep its peg one direction, but m more floating the other direction. Um, so it's you know interesting that like like we're now like if you zoom in here like just quibbling over like what seems to me to be a relatively small DPEG. You can see the effect of the winter mute lock here. By the way, is the CVX CRV DPEG went from ninety six to like basically the best peg in just a couple of minutes. Hmm. Interesting. Um... Yeah, until a while ago, YCRV was uh, pretty much like SDCRV. They were both uh, very close uh, with their peg, right, Gerrit? Yeah, yeah. So SDCRV and Y curve had uh, basically been close to 100%, like, you know, give or take yeah. a few percentage points. So it's nice that they're all kind of close. I feel like it might be an effect of there being like less and less uh, CRV on the market, but who knows? Like these markets are clown markets. Yeah, okay. I think it's clown markets, but it's also <laughs> the pro markets. You know, <laughs> the two sides of it. Yeah. Uh, if you had bought the bottom of the CVX curve peg, you would have outperformed everybody and the peg would have been restored. Uh, hey, guys, guess what? We have an optimism based BNB chain called OPBNB, which just launched. You can bridge to OPBNB now. And come over and check it out. I guess this is Binance's response to base. Uh, the, you know, I, you use BNB to come over to pay for transactions, and it looks pretty interesting. There's a lot of uh, funds that are actually being bridged over right now. Uh, there's transactions that are taking place. Looks like people are probably like deploying all of their rugs already. <laughs> 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 man be careful uh, out there folks be careful out there and i'm looking at it so it looks like it launched today and actually it did launch today and i'm already seeing uh 80 verified contracts that have been deployed um and we're seeing tens of thousands of transactions happening so people are using this you can go and uh 
come over and try OPBNB and see if it's actually worthwhile and going to be a competitive base. Maybe they build it in straight with uh, with Binance, so you can withdraw straight to there. I wonder what the the cost for making a transaction over there is. Man, I'm sure it's going to be uh, a very low cost. But I also like uh, if I would experiment uh, with uh, anything over there, I would only use like def I would definitely only use money I can lose to I can afford to lose because. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, guys, this is completely new, and uh, it's great to be opportunistic, but also like be responsible and be, be aware of what you're doing, because honestly, who knows? You know what I have to say about the base bridge uh, is that it is very fast. Like when I ported yeah. some ETH over using base, like it was there within 30 seconds. Honestly, wow. I, was, I was very surprised. Like having gone through all the stuff with Polygon where you had to like wait like 45 minutes and uh some of the other bridges as well too where you had to like wait an hour it was very nice to see like coinbase debut with a 40 second bridge uh, so i'll have to go test this one out I, I have like minimal amounts of bnb that i can bridge over and go uh go get rugged <laughs> yeah, also honestly if it's uh, money if it's like money that uh, you know you can afford to play with then i think these uh, games are actually great games to play and uh, yeah. to both sides to the coin yeah for sure i'm just saying yeah. guys like uh you know, what's cool you know the great thing about these l2s right. is that you know you can take over like five dollars and make thousands of transactions yeah 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 um so good luck to anybody who goes over stay safe um okay so my city of miami has launched or sorry helium which has those nifty helium miners that supposedly provide wi-fi to everybody who wants it yeah, i heard uh, about it once yeah, yeah finally have a new yorker i i am right now but uh one day we'll be back in miami miami in my heart <laughs> uh so my like the helium network where people have all these helium miners that they were buying and making gobs of money back on in the in the uh, beginning of DeFi summer, uh, are offering finally have enough service in Miami to offer a cheap unlimited plan and crypto token rewards. Um, so this is a long time coming. Uh, Helium had switched over last year to Solana uh, for speed and also uh, transaction costs. And uh, I wonder if they'll actually move over to having their own like app chain or L2 at some point and get off of Solana. Um, but this is pretty cool. So the $5 a month plan is marked down substantially from the previous $25 a month plan rate. And this is pretty cool. So you can actually use it as a mobile carrier, uh, as a mobile phone. So no contract unlimited plans typically start at $25 a month for like Verizon and other ones. But here you can get Helium Mobile for $5. Yeah, honestly, that's, uh, it will be very interesting to see new actors on like uh, in real markets, you know what I mean? Like actual markets, like internet markets, like if new service provided by something like that. But can it, compete with the, can it compete with the Solana phone? That's the real question. <laughs> well, maybe the Solana phone will use Helium. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, Honestly, it would be very exciting to see uh, such a new service uh, implemented, and if it actually works, I, I will be definitely uh, happy to hear about it. Because uh, I've, I've I know that people around here also uh, like uh, some of them play with this uh, stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. It, it it always seemed like a dream to me, you know, when I first heard about it. Like, can it actually work? Can it do it? But uh, I will be very happy to be surprised and see that uh, it can actually uh, does uh, become a whole new network and a whole new like way to access the internet. Yeah. So we got two more stories. The first being Aura has uh, passed AIP 42 to update Aura's tokenomics, and it will uh, provide a 15% increase in voting incentives capacity. Uh, which is approximately $60,000 worth of ARA tokens per cycle and a 1.75 million reduction in ARA emissions per year and then an effective cap in ARA mints against BAL. I should have someone from the ecosystem uh, on. I should try. Yeah, so uh, looks interesting. And then the last story that we got is that... Uh, Convex is going to be introducing CVX Prisma, 
So CVX Prisma will launch in sync with the locked Prisma airdrop distribution process. So all eligible locked Prisma in the airdrop will be optionally will optionally be claimed as liquid CVX Prisma directly on Convex. I'm following this story pretty closely, I got to say. Um, probably one of the more interesting stories to come out over the past 24 hours. Convex has been very picky and choosy about which tokens they launch a wrapper for. Uh, but when they do launch one, they tend to do pretty good, right? Like they chose not to do Conic for whatever reason, uh, but they did uh, you know, launch the CVX CRV wrapper, which has you know, gone on to corner of the curve supply. Um, they launched two uh, wrapped tokens, CVX FXS and CVX FBI, uh, which have gone on to accumulate plurality, if not majority, uh, voting power within the FRAX ecosystem. So the fact that they're like choosing to use their firepower on a, a CVX Prisma token is pretty interesting. And then on top of that, like they at the same time, Prisma is doing a DAO vote, which I would uh, definitely recommend that anyone who has locked the ECRV vote for. Uh, because if you look about halfway down there, uh, you'll note that uh, VECRV holders that approve this vote will receive a proportional share of a Prisma airdrop. So obviously, you've been on Twitter for the past like month doing anything with crypto. You've probably had a million scam airdrop announcements from uh, big <laughs> Prisma accounts. Uh, but this one, that Leviathan can confirm, is the real deal. <laughs> wow, that's cool. No, honestly, CVX is uh, looking uh, stronger and stronger. Like when you see the amount of uh, quality assets that's behind uh, each CVX voting power. Wow. Impressive. Yeah, my only regret is they're so anon, we're never going to get a CVX person on the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, te maybe text interviews are the way to go. And, uh, couldn't even squeeing that one, to be honest. <laughs> They declined, or like they uh, cold shouldered me on that one too. But I, I can dream. It's okay. We like you, CTTP. You're welcome <laughs> anytime. Um, well, that's going to wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Garrett, DeFi Advisor, as usual. Thank you, so. Thanks, and, the audience. Yeah. For you watching at home, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube if you're not already. Uh, we do live stream on our Telegram channel every day and. Sometimes yeah. we post funny things to Twitter, um, including headlines. And so you can find us at all those places. And we will be back tomorrow with another episode of Leviathan News. Amen to that.